the Opkan National Park, situated just south of Chiang Mai in northern Thailand. This lovely forest is a secondary forest. It's a monsoon forest or a so-called jungle, meaning we have rainy seasons and dry seasons. Although the forest looks very beautiful and prolific, there are two characters missing. One would be the wild large mammals. The other one would be the wild orchids. A monsoon forest could also be called jungle, and they are different from the ever wet rain forests. A monsoon forest is characterized by wet seasons and dry seasons. And right now we are about one third into the dry season. And one way for the native local trees to survive the drought is to be deciduous. So just like in temperate areas, the trees would shed their leaves to survive. This puts a very special uh, climatic stress to the local orchid species. They are different from the rainforest orchids, demanding ever wet situations. The orchid we see in this tree is a Cymbidium aloifolium. It is a native Thai species surviving thanks to the monks caring for the large trees. The second is a Dendrobium. Dendrobiums are native to Thailand and a characteristic in the dry season is they shed their leaves and what looks like aerial roots are in fact pseudobulbs. It's a nutrient storage organ. When you go orchid scouting in the nearby jungles, you may need a pair of binoculars to see the orchids high up in the trees. In this case we have spotted an orchid making fruits. This is a fertile orchid. Although we see a lot of trees here, this is not considered a forest. This is a plantation of South American rubber trees introduced to the north of Thailand. A forest is composed of a range of tree species and also of orchids, birds, mammals, and so forth. This is considered a crop, such as corn. Welcome to Doc My Garden and the Orchid Ark. We are situated in Chiang Mai in northern Thailand. And the aim of the Orchid Ark is to propagate seedlings of orchids, which we are going to use for restoration projects in the national parks. Part of the orchid ark is this orchid hospital. It is a nursery where orchids donated to us end up at first. We keep them until they make their flowers and so we can identify them. Successful restoration of a forest you need not only the orchid species itself, but you need the pollinating insect. The flower is adapted to a particular species of insect, which is needed for pollination and fruit formation. Without the insect, the orchid is still genetically dead. And here we try to see what are those insects. Surprisingly, in many cases, that is unknown. The purpose of the flower is to attract a special insect for its pollination. The purpose of pollination is fruit formation. Like all other flowering plants, orchids make fruits, but they are dry capsules and so many gardeners do not consider them fruits. A fruit is essentially a container of the seeds, the future generations. So when the insect is about to pollinate the orchid flower, it will first land on the lip of the orchid flower and then push its head inside. When the insect pulls out, it will open a lid where 
the pollinia, the male pollen, will attach to the body of the insect. When the insect moves on to the next flower, it will insert these pollinia into the stigma, the female part of the orchid flower. And that is the pollination and the first stage in the formation of the orchid fruit. In order to attract a pollinating insect, some orchid flowers mimic insect females and others mimic insect enemies. In this case, the orchid lip is extended, so the backside has a yellow spur which contains nectar, the reward for the pollinating insect. I am now holding the orchid flower upside down for a better view of its interior. At the end of the column you have the male pollinia. When the insect puts its body inside the flower to reach the nectar producing organ, it will, when it withdraws, push up the lid and the pollinia are stuck to the body of the insect. When the insect flies to a new flower, it will repeat the behavior, push its body inside, but this time the pollinia will stick to the pocket-like pocket -like stigma. I'm now going to use my finger instead of an insect to show you the pollination and the pollinia. I insert my finger into the lip and I will squeeze out, open up the lid, gently, gently. On my fingernail are now the beautiful yellow pollinia. In my hand I have the fruit of a Vanda Denisoniana orchid. This is another endangered orchid native to north of Thailand, Laos, Burma, and Vietnam. In this little fruit you have thousands of seeds and they are minute, they are tiny, so that they can blow with the wind high up into the trees where they germinate. But being small also means you cannot carry a picnic bag of extra nutrients. If you consider other seeds, say a grain from rice or a coconut, they are packed with nutrients for the plant embryo. In this case, the little embryo is alone. It cannot bring anything. Otherwise, it would not fly up into the treetops. And to compensate for the lack of nutrients, for the lack of a picnic bag, it parasitizes a fungus. This is called orchid mycorrhiza. Some people wonder why so many of Earth's about 25,000 orchid species are endangered? To a home gardener, an orchid can grow on plastic, on concrete or any bark you provide. But there are two very important bottleneck events in the life of an orchid. One is the seed establishment. The seed has to land in an environment that provides the perfect moisture, the perfect temperature, the perfect light intensity, and there must also be a special fungus which the young orchid parasitize on for its nutrients. You can bring as many endangered orchids back to the field as you want. If the pollinating insect is not present, you can consider the orchid genetically dead. It can no longer reproduce. In this tree, it's a longan tree, I grow the baronet orchid. This is a true native orchid species of the Chiang Mai Valley lowlands. As you can see from the broad leaves, this is a species favored by shade. So growing it in an evergreen tree seemed theoretically correct. Just in case, I planted only one specimen 
It is a pioneer specimen planted just to see is this a good spot or not. Since I got flowers and a well developed aerial root system within a year, it seems the plant is favored by the site. And thereby I dared planting one, two, three, four, five more specimens of the same species. Keeping them together like this is important so that their combined flowers create attraction for the pollinating insect. To the right of me here is a small brown orchid. We had many pollinating insects visiting the flower, but we still received new fruit formation. This hints to us this is in fact a hybrid, and a sterile hybrid cannot be used for restoration efforts. To my left is one of the largest orchid species in the world, it's the tiger orchid. It is critically endangered in Thailand because when it becomes around 10 years old, it will be twice the size of this five-year-old and at that size it would fetch a price of 25 to 35,000 baht. And that is very tempting for a farmer who may dig it up and sell it to the nearest hotel or resort. So theft is one reason why orchids are endangered and this is another reason. So Eric, why is it important, so important, to preserve these inconspicuous little species that might be disappearing? If we don't preserve all species in a forest, the forest is incomplete. It's a faulty ecosystem. We saw before plantations of trees. That is only one species. It's still not a forest. You need the mammals, the butterflies, the orchids. Everything has to be together. Otherwise, we have no forests left at all on Earth. We have plank plantations. For me, it is also heartbreaking realize that we exterminate species. Thirdly, for people who only think in economical terms, we are destroying fantastic chemical factories. Uh, you have orchids, plants, mushrooms, all capable of making very interesting chemicals that can be used medicinally and in various industrial processes. But the problem is, how do we actually go about implementing procedures for protecting the environment? Thailand has a very good position for helping their endangered species. Number one, Thailand has a lot of national parks already. You need to preserve huge tracts of land to save many endangered species. Secondly, Thailand has a very good legislation. Other countries don't. What is lacking in Thailand is law enforcement. You need to have an educated police force and educated national park rangers who know about the laws. You also need a population that is no longer so poor they have to rely on theft and small-scale hunting in the national parks. You have to fight poverty to help saving endangered orchids and other species. You need a population in general that is aware of their own flora and fauna. You also need collectors of orchids who are aware that they should buy orchids from CITES certified dealers. That is, dealers who have signed a contract with CITES, making them allowed, legally allowed, to trade orchids between the borders. This of course means that within the country there can be a lot of illegal activities. You see many illegal orchid markets in Thailand you can see people selling orchids by roadside stands and then we're back to the law enforcement problem. The schools fill a very important function in this work. I believe the schools need to teach the children about the value of their native flora and their native fauna and how they can help when they grow up and have various 
working positions in society. So five things are essentially needed. We need national parks, we need good laws and good law enforcement, we need to fight poverty, we need a good educational system so everybody in society are aware of their native flora and fauna and we need responsible orchid collectors.